Trigger warning. India's alarming escalation in hate speech. It's a story the mainstream media have an aversion to. New year, new shutdown. Beijing's crackdown on journalism in Hong Kong continues. Plus, informants doing the Kremlin's bidding and putting news organizations on Russia's blacklist. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. We begin with India and a social media space that is teeming with hatred directed at Muslims, messages that are often accompanied with calls for violence. 2022 began with the emergence of a mobile app conducting a mock auction online, listing the names and the photographs of dozens of prominent Muslim women put up for sale. Actresses, activists, journalists, all of whom have spoken out on Islamophobia and the notion of Hindu supremacy, what's known as Hindutva. That auction app appeared online just after two Hindu fundamentalist conferences were held in northern India, where speakers urged their followers to attack minorities in speeches that were tantamount to calls for genocide against Muslims. Yet, as is the pattern in the world's second most populous country, it took journalists working outside of mainstream outlets to expose those stories, forcing establishment news organizations and the Indian authorities to do what no longer seems to come naturally, their jobs. Our starting point this week is New Delhi. In today's India, a religious gathering can turn into a call to arms, an invitation for Hindu worshippers to hate the other. There were two such meetings last month. Suresh Chafhanke, who runs a far-right Hindu nationalist news channel, attended the one in New Delhi, where he urged his audience to take an oath. That same weekend, 200 kilometers to the north, in Haridwar, the message was no less explicit. The them are Indian Muslims. The Haridwar conference was organized by a Hindu priest, Yati Narsinghanand. Narsinghanand is an engineer educated in Russia, and he's now a Hindu priest and a rabble rouser. What he says is not as much hate speech as an outright call for genocide. All his speeches appear to go viral because he has obviously struck a chord in Hindu society and uh, he does his rabble rousing with no hindrance from the government. His Twitter account has been suspended and his YouTube account uh, was also uh, blocked because it violated community guidelines. But if you do a quick Google search, you'll find his videos splashed across various uh, various channels. Suresh Chavankhe is the founder and the editor of this news channel called Sudarshan News. They are blatantly Islamophobic and highly influential, especially when it comes to their short videos which circulate you know, uh, widely around WhatsApp. Also to add to that, Chavankhe has nearly half a million followers on Twitter. It is certainly something we need to be concerned about, but I think we also need to understand the context in which they were appeared. A lot of Hindu groups have indeed become radicalized because of what they see is a one-sided narrative, both in the secular parties and in the global media, which they are now reacting to. They don't agree with their language that they use. But I certainly believe, understand where they're coming from. There is a very organized um, ecosystem of hate. They uh, instigate violence, uh, they spread fake news, and uh, that ecosystem is organized by uh, thousands, perhaps millions of people who are allied with the government. They're all over social media, helping to amplify bigotry of a kind that we have never seen uh, before. That bigotry comes in many forms. On New Year's Eve, a new app showed up online. Bully Buy presented itself as a human auction. It was fake, but the victims were real. More than 100 Muslim women, 
actors, journalists, public figures, including the Pakistani Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai, offered up as would-be servants for their Hindu masters. The goal was to shame those women, to silence them. Mohammad Zubair is a journalist for a site called Alt News. His reporting was crucial in exposing those Hindu gatherings in Delhi and Haridwar. Zubair has also helped police in their investigations of Bulibar, which has been taken offline. Some of those allegedly involved have been arrested. They call themselves as trad accounts. Uh, trads are something similar to neo-Nazis or white supremacists. These people, uh, they, they actually even hate BJP because according to them, they are not as anti-Muslim as they think they should be. I'm, I'm particularly also in touch with the, the Mumbai police in helping them investigate the case, and which is still going on. They've, uh, they've arrested uh, or they've detained three people. But I would say they are not the main culprits. They're all just the pawns. They've been played by the bigger players. In those fields, they're losing demographically, even within the context of India, which is the only country which has a Hindu majority. Where there are 15 Muslim majority countries, 100 Christian, Christian majority countries. So if you do not protect your culture and heritage in the one country where you are a majority, then I think uh, you're going to lose the battle in terms of protecting what you have inherited from the past. So this is the broader uh, context in which all this hate is happening. What stands out most in the coverage of this story is the lack of it. And it's not for a lack of resources. India has more than 400 24-hour television news channels, more than 100,000 newspapers, and countless news sites. Most of them have fallen in line with the ruling BJP party and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Too many news outlets are dependent on the money Modi's government spends on advertising. In such a competitive market, they are as reliant on the majority Hindu population for clicks and ratings as the BJP are on Hindus for votes. So they gave the stories of those religious gatherings and the tsunami of anti-Muslim messaging online short shrift. National newspapers burying reports of hate speech on the inside pages while surrendering part of the front page to the BJP's nationalistic messaging, bought and paid for by the Indian taxpayer. The Indian Express is a best-selling daily in India. Now, the advertisement that came on the front page was shocking. A man who had a kefia around his neck and looking very evidently Muslim, hold like a petrol bomb in his hand. That's the image they showed of what it was like before the BJP came in power in 2017. Now the next image showed the same man after 2017 with his hands folded, begging for mercy. This is extremely divisive propaganda and it also reflects on the state of the mainstream media in India. Because the mainstream media have either been uh, browbeaten into silence or they have um, allied themselves with the government and they have almost entirely become cheerleaders of the government and the ruling party. The main television channels, the ones that uh, support the government, have almost completely ignored the meetings and it's not just me saying that the party runs fake news factories. A few years ago, Home Minister Amit Shah, who is the second most powerful man in this country, addressed party workers and what he called social media warriors. Uh, this is what he said, we are capable of delivering any message we want to the public, whether sweet or sour, true or fake, because we have 3.2 million people in our WhatsApp groups. The other institution whose failure to condemn amounts to a form of complicity is the Indian government. The evidence of incitement is there, online for all to see. Rhetoric that verges on the genocidal, yet those responsible almost never get arrested. Having pandered to Hindu supremacists when campaigning for votes, the Modi government has enabled extremists, normalized their views. And some BJP figures, like this member of parliament, can sound just like them, demanding the conversion of non-Hindus. Those who have gone out of the Hindu fold must be brought back in whole, brought back into the Hindu faith, brought back to the mother faith. The MP later withdrew that statement, but the video remains on his YouTube channel. It's still making the rounds on social media.
it's not just the media that's supposed to be the watchdog it's also the executive it's also the judiciary it's also in the parliament in the legislature there are other authorities there are other institutions that are also supposed to act our job now is to continue to do what we do ask the right questions seek accountability because this will serve as an archive of what's happening in india the only people who can stop uh, this worrying transformation that's uh, going on in india are indians themselves but it is not easy to convert the converted we have seen that in america we have seen it in in, in so many other countries the media have a very important role to play but the mainstream media as we know are substantially sold out or have been co-opted by the government so if you're asking me what is the answer for that i don't really know i just know that people like us in the independent media must continue doing what we can but there is no one answer as to what can be done Another media story that's on our radar this week comes out of Hong Kong, where a couple of prominent news outlets have been forced to shut down. Minakshi Ravi is here with the details. Thank you, Richard. Stand News and Citizen News were two of the last pro-democracy media websites still active in Hong Kong. They're now gone, and some say it's one of the final nails in the coffin of Hong Kong's once active and outspoken media space. Late in December, Stan's newsroom was raided by 200 police officers. Several staffers were arrested on suspicion of conspiring to publish what the authorities called seditious material. On December 27th, the outlet closed down. That had a ripple effect. A week later, another outlet, Citizen News, shut down. Chris Young, the founder of Citizen News, had this to say. Um, the indications are clear that um, uh, overall uh, media is facing a, a an increasingly tough uh, environment. And, and for those uh, who, who are being seen as uh, crit critical or troublemakers, um, they, are more, they are more vulnerable. And, and that's why we um, made the decision. It's worth going back a bit to understand the political context to this. In 1997, Britain, which had colonized Hong Kong, handed back control of the city to China. Beijing publicly committed to allow a certain level of autonomy, but bit by bit has failed to live up to that promise. Instead, the Chinese Communist Party has been tightening its grip on Hong Kong with serious implications for democracy and free speech there. Since 2020, when China introduced a controversial national security law, at least four news outlets have been forced to close. More than a dozen journalists have been arrested, while the authorities have ordered a complete overhaul of the public broadcaster, RTHK. But it's not just news outlets. The enforcement of the national security law has been used in a manner that squeezes all kinds of dissenting voices and curbs discussion, let alone debate, on sensitive topics. Take the Pillar of Shame, an iconic statue in memory of the victims of China's 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. For the past 24 years, it stood on the grounds of the University of Hong Kong. Last month, though, the university's management decided to remove it, citing legal advice and risk assessments. The disappearance of the statue came as no surprise to Hong Kongers, but it has been seen as very symbolic, a marker of just how dramatically the space for expression has narrowed in Hong Kong. Thank you, Mina. In May of last year, Russian authorities embarked on a campaign that threatened to snuff out critical news coverage in the country completely. Dozens of journalists and media outlets were classified as foreign agents, or worse, undesirable. These are labels that are reminiscent of the country's Soviet past, and practically speaking, they can have a ruinous effect on reporting, making it dangerous for journalists to work in Russia, as well as deterring both their sources and their advertisers. Some news outlets have been forced to cease their operations completely. Fronting this effort to criminalize critical news outlets is a handful of so-called patriotic activists working for Kremlin-friendly organizations. They provide a facade of an active civil society. Russia is a country not short of underreported news stories. Taboo topics such as the abuse of power are not hard to come by. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on some of the news outlets targeted that have revealed graft and wrongdoing on the part of the Russian elite. 
очередной черный день для российских медиа. Сегодня генпрокуратура признала нежелательным первое средство массовой информации. Речь об издании проект. To be proclaimed as undesirable, it literally means to be proclaimed as an enemy. You are public enemy. Только при упоминании в СМИ его имени и издания проект обязательно приписка иностранный агент. Our media is completely split into two camps. One group carries its work out honestly and in good faith. The other slanders and tries to tarnish our country for a client. The client is well known, the US State Department and the CIA. Уйсени не иностранных агентов, не нежелательных организаций, не в личном, не в организационном качестве. The speed with which this unfolded, it was like someone high up simply said, enough. Someone who was done with independent journalists in Russia. He just woke up one spring morning in 2021 and decided, let's just put an end to this. Since then, it's been open season on journalists. Dozens of news organizations and reporters have been blacklisted, classified as foreign agents, undesirable, or both. Nobody knows for certain what spurred the authorities to act. It could have been the botched poisoning of Alexei Navalny, now imprisoned, his opposition movement outlawed, for which the Kremlin faced few consequences. Perhaps the authorities were triggered by what they saw in neighboring Belarus, where the government was hunting journalists down. Or was it the larger context, the series of investigative bombshells that have exposed Russian officials, revealing rampant corruption in Vladimir Putin's inner circle and beyond? We tried to touch the most tabooed, the most underreported topics we did a series of articles on the secret families of Russian top rank officials. First was Mr. Putin. It was a story on his secret wife and his previously unknown daughter. We established that they have really enormous wealth. This story, it was like a big bomb in Russia. So we don't know for sure what was the immediate story, which made them angry but I guess all of them. <laughs> in July last year, Projekt, a non-profit registered in the US, was labeled an undesirable organization. Roman Badanian, who was also labeled a foreign agent, learned of his new status on holiday with his family and made a decision not to return to Russia. One of the more curious aspects of the case brought against Projekt is the role played by pro-Kremlin activists like Vitaly Baradin. Baradin is a former employee of Russia's Interior Ministry, who once called Vladimir Putin his political idol. He's active on Instagram, where he shares photos of himself rubbing shoulders with Russia's elite. Baradin made the complaint that kick-started proceedings against Projekt. In it, he cited verbatim an article from state-owned broadcaster RT which alleged Projekt had received foreign funding. We saw the investigation on RT. We saw that Roman Bedanian does not hide his links with the US and decided to consult the prosecutor's office to check Projekt's funding and list these journalists as foreign agents. These people who are trying to create a so-called revolution in this country are completing an order from the American intelligence services and they aren't hiding the fact that this is what they're doing. In 2020, Project examined the close relationship between the director of Russia's foreign intelligence service, Sergei Nashkin, and billionaire property developer, God Nisanov. Russia's top spy master has seen bumping fists with the businessman after taking a swim in his personal pool. Borodin says that investigation crossed the line. These people who worked on a story about the head of foreign intelligence are almost the same as terrorists. Show me one country where people are deliberately running around filming heads of state, filming the intelligence chiefs. Bedanian is lucky that our authorities, our special services, let him and journalists like him live in peace. 
the Russian authorities, they need to have a useful idiot who makes a complaint that we are breaking the law. This guy was Mr. Baradin in our case. He does something for the Russian authorities and he receives some benefits from that, some money, some influence. I run an organization which represents the interests of the community, of our citizens. What does it mean that we're some kind of snitches for the Kremlin? Who calls me that? Opposition media? Why doesn't our media call me that? They are just frontmen, put forward to create the illusion that there is a big group of activists fighting for freedom of information and information sovereignty. I'm not sure this scheme has worked. And if you meet them, you realize that these people want one thing, power. And they use these strange methods of complaining about independent media to get power for themselves. Lilia Yapanova is a Moscow-based correspondent for Medusa, whose headquarters are in Latvia. The consequences of being a foreign agent seem designed to slowly kill off the business model that allowed Medusa to become Russia's most popular independent media outlet. Medusa sold advertising to fund its journalism, including to state-owned companies who bolted after it was listed as a foreign agent. The outlet lost more than 95% of its advertisers in a week. Foreign agents are required to post this warning alongside whatever they publish. This also needs to be included on personal posts on social media. The label, foreign agent, not only deters advertisers, but also sources and contributors. However, it doesn't appear to have put off Medusa's audience. Donations from 100,000 readers have kept the outlet afloat for now. I'd say our audience even got slightly bigger because everyone was suddenly interested in who this Russian foreign agent was. This repression made people have compassion for us and we had a successful crowdfunding campaign. If this whole story of enemies of the people, foreign agents and undesirable organizations had been put in motion five years ago when people still trusted the government, it would have had an effect. But now I think it's very limited. That leaves Russian news consumers with a choice. Journalism produced by what the Kremlin sees as loyal patriots, or that produced by traitors. The foreign agent law, first adopted in 2012 and expanded several times since, is being used against almost anyone who receives money from abroad and voices a political opinion. But many of the critically minded news outlets targeted now emerged after previous government efforts to control TV and the press. They know how to adapt to survive. Based on my experience, based on Soviet experience, I believe that Russian journalism can survive the future and survival of Russian independent investigative journalism is in potential collaborations we all under attack and the only way to survive this attack is to be all together. There are a lot of media outlets who are surviving on the subscription model and as far as I can tell Medusa isn't about to close. Despite the repression we found enough subscribers so I can only conclude that Russians are prepared to pay for the news, to keep informed, to get insight into what the world looks like. As long as they have this wish, I think we will definitely survive. And finally, back to Hong Kong, the assault on freedom of the press there. The problem with news headlines about things like media closures or the arrests of journalists is that headlines disappear just as quickly as they appear, and the bigger picture can get lost. But add them all together, on a timeline for instance, and the story becomes far more clear. For more than a decade now, China has been chipping away, and more recently hacking away, at free speech in Hong Kong. We'll leave you now with a timeline that we've put together on this story, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.